It's January 20th, 2021, Inauguration Day in America. Welcome to this special live edition of The Carlos Watson Show. Now, hours ago, as you all know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were sworn in as president and vice president, respectively, of these United States. But in the days and weeks leading up to this historic moment, the country has seemed anything but united, from the contentious election to controversies over the release of the COVID-19 vaccine, to obviously even the breach of the Capitol building in D.C. Our new administration has got a lot of work to do if it's really going to bridge the gap between blue and red, black and white, haves and have-nots, you name it, there's a lot of work to be done. It's a pivotal time for our nation, and over the course of the next hour, we're going to engage in what I hope will really be a bold, fresh, and different kind of conversation. We're going to talk to people from a variety of parties. We'll talk to some of the best thought leaders in the country. We'll talk to interesting celebrities on the topic. We'll talk to everyday people, not only about where the country has come from, but maybe more importantly, where we're headed. Most importantly, though, I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll join us in the comments. hope you'll share questions on social media. Thank you again for being here for our inauguration after show as we engage in what we're calling the people's conversation and reflect on how we might all join together to help reset America. All right, today may just be the first step. I've got a couple of interesting pieces of conversation that I want you to see as we get started. I think the reality of our racial struggle right now, in part, is for black people to ascend in a meaningful way, the truth is you need white buy-in too. We have a system where three white men, Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, and Bill Gates, own more wealth than the bottom 50% of our country. That is deplorable. That's a level of inequality that cannot persist. That was uh, Megyn Kelly and Congressman Jamal Bowman from the Bronx kicking off this conversation about national unity. Joining us now and to continue the conversation, uh, former White House communications director and chief speechwriter for Bill Clinton, President Clinton, the 42nd Commander-in-Chief, Don Baer. We're also joined by Aussie Media Editor-at-Large and Professor at Fordham University, Dr. Christina Greer. Welcome to both of you. Good to see both of you today. Well, thanks. thanks. Great to see you. Um, Christina, let me start with you. How do you think about this inauguration day? Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I assume it all in all was a positive day. Yeah, for the most part, I think so many Americans are just breathing a collective sigh of relief, uh, recognizing just how traumatic the last four years have been. Obviously, today was a day of many historic firsts, not just with Kamala Harris, uh, the child of immigrants, uh, first African-American, an Indian American vice president, uh, but in the Senate, we've got Raphael Warnock from the state of Georgia. We've got John Ossoff, Jewish American from the state of Georgia. We've got uh, you know representation from California, uh, Latino representation from the state of California for the Democrats. So I, I think a lot of people are celebrating uh, just a new chapter. Uh, it's not lost on folks that Donald Trump did not attend the inauguration. Uh, so as I wrote today in Ozzy, you know, this idea of a peaceful transference of power is somewhat in question because this is unprecedented behavior. But I think many people are looking forward to trying to figure out what a path looks like moving forward, not just policy-wise, but really rebuilding the nation from uh, the past four years, the past 10 months, and more explicitly from the events of January 6th. Uh, Don Baer, uh, your career has intersected in some interesting ways uh, with Joe Biden and with inaugural days. If I remember correctly, uh, you covered Biden's first campaign for uh, president 30-plus uh, uh, years ago. Uh, you've been involved in uh, inaugural day speeches, so you probably thought a little bit about that. How do you reflect on today? Is Biden off to a good start? Maybe it's too early to say it in that way. But, but how do you see uh, today uh, from the perspective of the 46th commander-in-chief, Joe Biden? Or unless you're dating me, that's for sure. But uh, and 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 20, 24 years ago today, this evening, uh, I was like uh, breathing a sigh of relief because President Clinton had delivered his second inaugural address, uh, and we were through it. We were done. Uh, but I actually, I, I today, in a way I hadn't fully expected, found this to be such an opening and such a, not just a relief, but a real sense of optimism. And, and what could be possible here. And I think Joe Biden, who you're right, I, I started covering Joe Biden's first presidential campaign in 1987. Just think about that. He ended it actually uh, before the 88 primary, primaries ever started. He dropped out of the race. And um, I've been watching him obviously for all these years and have seen this from many different perspectives. 
I think in his tried and true way, he did something today that I had not anticipated. He, he spoke to the American people in a genuine, authentic, really almost plain way. Uh, there wasn't a lot of highfalutin rhetoric in that speech, but I think it really reached in and grabbed people uh, in a way that we needed and we need right now. But again, at the end of the day, it's not going to be about the rhetoric. It's not about the words. He said that himself. It's going to be about the actions and getting things moving here very quickly uh, towards some sort of uh, positive direction. There's so much work that has not been done, and there's so much damage that has been done. Um, and it's time to get with it and get the job done. And I think that's what Biden and his team actually bring to this. You know, his team has been around him a long time. There are people who go back to the 1980s with him and certainly coming forward all those decades since who have been working together with him and with one another. Um, and I think maybe it's not as exciting, not necessarily as inspirational as we might have imagined it could be, but you know, what they do know how to do is to get the job done. And I think now's the time for that. You, you know, Christina, it's interesting as I hear Don uh, talk about Joe Biden, who got elected to the Senate in 72, ran uh, in 88, ran again in 2008, declined to run in 2016, ran in 2020. Do you hear all that experience and that makes you feel like he is up to the task? Or were you one who was... Uh, uh, so clear that there should be a different choice than President Trump, that, that you welcomed him, but you welcomed him maybe more tepidly. Where are you on Joe Biden in terms of his ability to have bold and powerful impact? Right. Well, where I was a year ago and where I am now are two totally different places. I mean, you know, as someone who studies black politics, uh, there's a reason why Joe Biden did so well within the African-American electorate. It's because black voters don't have the luxury just to always vote for their first choice. They have to vote strategically, knowing the limitations of what the white electorate will allow. And so Joe Biden was that candidate uh, in 2020 that it was essentially uh, not too progressive. He's more of a centrist. But I think his loyalty to Barack Obama for eight years really does mean something. It meant something to voters then, and I think it really means something to people now. And also that experience that he brings. You know, in 2009, I don't think Americans fully understood just how close uh, to the cliff we were economically. Uh, and how Joe Biden and Barack Obama were charged with essentially saving the American economy and in many ways the global economy. And so in this moment where we're still struggling to get COVID under control, when we see African Americans dying at three times the rate of other Americans, uh, where economically millions of Americans of all different racial and ethnic stripes are really struggling, uh, I think Joe Biden's experience uh, from his days with Barack Obama means something to a lot of folks. And the fact that, you know, he is a touch long in the tooth, but he believes in science and he believes in listening to other smart people in the room. So I think the, the experience coupled with his, with his ability to recognize what he knows and what he knows he doesn't know uh, will actually serve us quite well uh, because it does seem like Joe Biden's the type of person uh, to listen to younger folks, to listen to people who have different perspectives. And I think that's why he chose Kamala Harris. We saw on the debate stage they didn't always agree, but uh, he was a pretty powerful vice president. And so I have a feeling he'll utilize Kamala Harris as a powerful vice president to be the first in the room and the last to leave the room as he's making some really difficult decisions uh, in, in a moment in American history where he's battling not just the COVID crisis, not just an economic crisis, not a crisis of you know, white insurrectionists uh, that are sort of throughout the, the country and also our military and our police forces, but really trying to get a collective vision of how we can heal ourselves both literally and figuratively. Don, to, to uh, piggyback on what Christina is saying, what would a strong start for Joe Biden look like? What would tell you either 100 days in, which has become kind of a popular metric for presidents going back to FDR, or a year in, how would you know whether or not Joe Biden was on track for at least a strong first term? Well, a few things, but before I turn to that, I want to say one thing. We were almost 10 minutes into this conversation before we even took note of what may be the most important thing about today from history standpoint, which is Kamala Harris being uh, sworn in as the first woman and the first person of color in national office in the entire history of this country. I mean, as Joe Biden said in his inaugural address today, don't tell me that change can't happen. Um, so we're I, not that I don't mean to make it sound token in any way whatsoever. We are on the path now 
to some major changes. And I think that's what you're going to find from, from, from Biden and his administration. Look, the first 100 days, we are still in the clutches of this pandemic crisis. Uh, and, and again, tremendous damage has been done. 400,000 Americans are gone, are dead. And there's more to come. And we are way behind with the vaccine and way behind with our public health effort. So I think the first 100 days, as much as anything, are going to be focused on that and, and really trying to make sure that we get this under control. Because nothing else that is good that can happen in this country can happen until we do that. That's that, going that, to need that, to be linked to the, to the economy and things that we're going to have to do to continue to keep the economy moving forward and stimulated. I think that's where you'll see the activity. It, it, it does make sense. It's been interesting to hear Biden and his team talk about involving the National Guard and the military in order to make sure it happens expeditiously. Um, uh, Dr. Christina Greer, Don Baer, I'm going to leave it there. But thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And I look forward to continuing uh, this conversation with you in the uh, days, weeks and months ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Continuing our conversation on national unity and actually picking up uh, where she left off in the clip that we saw just a little bit ago. I'm pleased to welcome very special guest to our live broadcast. Joining us now is journalist and host of the Megan Kelly Show podcast. Megan Kelly, Megan, good to see you again. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to see you too. Um, Megan, how did you read uh, Joe Biden's inauguration today? Um, I thought he, he did very well. You know, I thought he struck the right tone. And uh, I liked how he ended it a lot with the, the part about how, you know, not everything has to be uh, four alarm fi fire, you know, that, that, that not all of our political differences have to result in these bare knuckled brawls. He said it more elegantly than that. But I thought that was the right message. Um, I was interested to see how conservatives would react on Twitter, you know, just because they're not thrilled about Joe Biden, as you know. And so what were they going to say about it? I think they thought identity politics found its way into the speech and, and that wasn't going to lead to unity. But I thought I, I would definitely give him an A overall on the remarks. And, um, you know, it's one of those things, Carlos, where I don't know. I, I every time I go to one of these things, I feel patriotic. You know, I was at Barack Obama's and I was at George W. Bush's and I, I was not at Trump's, but I was at this one, um, watching this one. And you just feel something swell in your heart for America. And I realized this one was abnormal. Trump wasn't there, but I still felt it. And so I'm feeling kind of hopeful right now, but I know it'll be gone by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't say that because it may not be gone. And I do know what you mean in that there is that hopeful feeling. There is that sense, as uh, Biden talked about, that democracy has been tested, that we've been reminded again how special it is, how fragile it is, and there may be an opportunity uh, to move forward. You know, I've had some interesting conversations, Megan, over the last couple of months, and a couple stand out to me. One was with Deepak Chopra, um, who said, Carlos, at a moment like this where the country was so closely divided, where, you know, with 44,000 votes in a handful of states, things could have ended up uh, in President Trump's favor instead of here, uh, now is the time for Democrats and Biden to, to reach out very openly, look to very actively find common ground, and to try and, even if it means going slower on some of his uh, key priorities, and he's listed four of them, to go ahead and do that in the spirit of unity. On the other hand, spoke to Reverend Al Sharpton, who said, uh, everything about being a minister makes me want to say, Carlos, that we should extend an olive branch and we should do that. But he said the work is so urgent from COVID deaths to other things that he said, I think that unfortunately, I think this moment requires uh, people to, quote unquote, do the righteous thing and to really focus. And if that means that there's not bipartisan support, so be it. Let's get to a better place where that can happen. How do you see that? Because we obviously are facing some pretty meaningful challenges, including uh, sadly, COVID and all the COVID deaths um, that have come with it. Would, would you lean more towards where Deepak was? Would you lean more towards where Reverend Sharpton is or, or another path altogether? Well, I, I don't think Joe Biden's going to hire me to be an advisor anytime soon. But if he did, <laughs> I, I would tell him if I were a Democrat, just go for it. Do, push through. You've got control of, of the House. You've got you know, narrow control of the Senate. You have a narrow window to get through the agenda items that you want through. And anybody who's telling you that they want a kumbaya moment is probably a Republican looking to slow down your agenda or limit it, right? And I think that's exactly what the Republicans would like. Um, they would love to have buy-in on their side in the name of unity to get, you know, take the um, what's happening at the border. You know, Joe Biden's going to try to find a path to citizenship for 11 million people who are here undocumented. 
And it, this one doesn't have a carrot for Republicans, like, and we'll increase border security. Mm-hmm. Well, he could put that in, and that would make Republicans a tiny bit happier, but it's not going to make them support his efforts here. Uh, so what I think, realistically, is we're going to fight. The country, it's not in a mood for unity. I know I don't mean to, bu- to burst the balloon on the day of the la la America, but we're going to fight. And so if I were Biden, I'd just push my stuff through. And what I try to do for unification is talk about the other side of the country in a generous way. Make a show like he did today of going to church with McConnell. Just show the country that we can, we can fight. We can do the bare knuckle brawling without demonizing one another. And in a way that sort of, I don't know, that reminds us we're Americans. We're, we're on Team America first, right? Uh, if we could get back to that, that would be some progress. Talk to me about about Trump and where Trump goes from here, do you think? Because you obviously have the impeachment going on. You have potential criminal inquiries. You have all sorts of stuff. What do you know him probably as well as any journalist uh, there? You've tangled with him in the past. Where do you expect to see him go from here? What do you expect to see happen as it relates to the 45th commander in chief? Well, I don't think it's a Richard Nixon. You're not going to have me to kick around anymore moment. I mean, Trump's oxygen is attention. And, you know, he was a massive national figure prior to running for office because he needs it. You know, he does. It's just the way he's built. And he will be again. Um, I think the unfortunate thing for him is one of the things he's probably most looking forward to is ongoing rallies, where I think he probably hoped that the news media would take the rallies and he would get on television. He could say what he wanted to say. I'm not sure that's going to happen, given what happened at the Capitol a couple of weeks ago. Right. But... I will also say that in the way that we saw liberals want everything in the Trump presidency to be the death knell to his presidency, you know, like this is it and this, if, if just this, this is it. I still don't think even what happened at the Capitol is that moment. His supporters, they're just not going to abandon him. And so while you've seen some Republicans who never really loved him, you know, now saying we're done, goodbye. And, right. and maybe we'll support impeachment so he can never run again and we can officially be rid of him. His core support is still there. It's still there. Well, and what do you think happens to people like Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, Josh Hawley of Missouri, um, a couple of senators who who objected uh, to the Electoral College certification? Uh, some people in, in the most uh, uh, critical moment have referred to them as the treason uh, caucus. What do you think happens to their political fortunes, those that are in office but defied Mitch McConnell and stuck with uh, uh, President Trump. Do you think they're hurt going forward, or they actually helped in a world in which Trump remains kind of a really powerful force? I think they're politically wounded, um, but people do tend to have short memories, so I don't know. I, I guess when we were closer to the event, I was more on the team of there. Those guys don't have a presidential shot anymore. Cruz, you know, had already said he was looking at that. I guess I, I'm not so sure anymore because you know. I think people forgive pretty quickly, and I think the Republicans are getting ready for a fight, and so they're probably looking for more teammates, not not fewer. But I, I don't know. He hurt himself. There's no question. Holly and Cruz. That picture of Holly, and I understand maybe he wasn't looking at at rioting. He thought he was looking at good old American protest with that fist up. But that's not a good picture for him. Um, I will say though, Carlos, that this all this stuff about there's a group at Harvard that wants to take away their Harvard degrees, a group of students, and I guess some professors. Some people want them on the no-fly list. Um, Some people want them disbarred. That stuff is nuts. And that's exactly the crazy type of lunacy we should be avoiding. That stuff we don't need to unnecessarily divide us, right? Like policy, it's gonna divide us. But that stuff, forget about that stuff. That's like crazy college kid nutcase stuff that the adults in the room need to say goodbye. No, not this time. Hey, a, a final question uh, here to you. Um, so much of the leadership right now in the country is older, or as Christina called it, long in the tooth. Uh, Vice President Biden, 78, uh, Mitch McConnell in his 80s, um, uh, Supreme Court Justice Breyer, they're trying to encourage him uh, to retire. I think he's, he's 82. Obviously, Speaker Pelosi uh, is north of 80. Concern to you, and I don't mean this in a snarky way, but I mean this in a, there are so many urgent issues and so many, if you will, kind of quote unquote new issues, as uh, President Biden talked about the first serious pandemic uh, in uh, in 100 years, depending on how you think about it. 
things like cryptocurrency and other kinds of challenges. Is there any of that that, that you worry about as an American and as someone who thinks about policy and leadership? You know, I have to say, I'm not bothered by the age of our leaders in particular. I, I sort of come from the honor thy father, father and mother place and believe that we're, we're kind of ageist in our society. You know, you, we don't throw out the, the, the person just because they get elderly and we think that they're, um, I don't know, not, not as relevant anymore. Now, if you have a, a mental deterioration, that's a different story. Um, but I think that with age comes some wisdom and some experience, and that could be helpful. You know, you need younger inputs. You know, on my podcast, I'll have on um, Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty, who host uh, Rising on the Hill.com. It's a it's a young show. She's a little center left. He's a little center right. They're they're younger, and when you hear their ideas, you're like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, you're coming at it from a new angle. So I think it takes a bit of both, you know, to make the all the ingredients present in, in the greatest cake we could bake. All right, all right, Megan, I said I was letting you go, but got to ask you, any chance I'm going to see you run in uh, 2022, 2024? Stop it. I wouldn't even know what to run as. I, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm in, an independent. I don't even know if my, my you know, independent people can win. Um, but no, I right now I'm podcasting. I get to be with my family. I get to pay the bills. So I'm good. And, and I really, one of the reasons I didn't love cable news is because it was so toxic and so angry and so hateful all the time. And I do think if I ran for office, it would be out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> all right. Well, next time you come on, we're going to talk about the future of media a little bit, because I do think this is an interesting inflection point, not just with cable news, but everything from TikTok to the Clubhouse app to all sorts of, of different things. Will Twitter change in a post-Trump world? So uh, next time we get together, we're going to have to talk a little bit about podcasting, media, and more. Love it. You're on. All right, Megan, good to see you. Thanks again for joining us. All right, throughout the show, we're going to be featuring Aussie subscribers who will be giving their own opinions on the inauguration and the conversation at hand. Right now, you can also join that conversation, so please be sure uh, to do that. All right, I want to welcome a trio of commentators who voted for the 45th Commander-in-Chief, President Donald J. Trump, in this past election. We've got Ken Schuster with us, uh, Robert Sosa, and Leah Tatum. And I want to get their take on uh, national unity. Uh, uh, Leah, Ken, Robert, good to see you guys. Hi. Good to see you. How are you? Good. I'm good. It's uh, uh, what an interesting couple of weeks, Leah. I feel like... Uh, I feel like 2020 was so long ago now. <laughs> I mean, I know it's only January 20th, but it feels it feels like it was uh, long ago a little bit. Uh, Leah, where are you right now? Where in the uh, country are you as we speak? So I am down in Charleston, South Carolina. And, and Leah, how did you think about uh, President Trump's uh, last days in office? Were you supportive of his challenge to the election results? Were you... Uh, uh, like some of the folks, Mitt Romney and others, frustrated with him uh, drawing it out. How did you think about how the president finished up his term? Wow, what a loaded question. Um, you know, I think that we need to, as Americans on either side, I think if there is doubt, I mean, you look at other elections that are happening all over the world, um, and there are, there is proof of fraud in different elections. And so I do think as Americans, there are times that maybe you do need to just kind of have a reality check and just kind of check into things. I don't think there's anything wrong with going through the due process and the political process got a little bit out of hand, I will say that. But I do think that as Americans to fight for the democracy, I don't think there's anything wrong with at some times questioning it. Um, many scholars and Benjamin Franklin and um, Albert Einstein both said, you know, at some times you do need to question authority. And I do think there probably could have been more respectful ways to do so. But I don't think there's anything wrong with checking back in with the process, making sure that everything is going as according to plan. Um, so while I will say that he, as in Trump, was never an eloquent speaker um, and polarizing at times, I do think that checking that democratic process and making sure that it is going according to plan is important. 
Um, uh, Leah, thank you for that. Ken, where are you in the country today? Where am I reaching you as we speak? The first thing I'm going to tell you is I can't clearly hear you, but I think you said that I'm, where am I? I'm in Orlando, Florida. Yeah, um, Ken, I'm sorry that you're not hearing me clearly, and uh, you're in my home state. I'm from Florida as well. I'm from Miami, so it's very nice to see you. Um, um, Ken, I don't know if you can hear me say this, but I know you voted for the president, uh, for former President Trump. Obviously, he didn't win. Uh, Biden took office today. Are you hopeful that we can be unified as a country, or does that feel like a pipe dream uh, to you? If I look inside myself, I'm hopeful. If I look on Facebook, if I look on social media, it was scattered that we're not sure where together is. And I would say that to both parties. Um, the Democratic Party is scattered. We had how many candidates? 16, 17 candidates at the beginning of the uh, primaries. The Republican Party has done a wonderful job of hiding the hatred for this guy called Trump, who jumped into their party after 45 years of being a Democrat and suddenly took the presidency away from everybody. Uh, it's, it's not just the Democrats he took it from, he took it from the Republicans too. So I think there's a, a lot of folks that are sitting around going, we don't know where the country is going, we don't know what together is. And if anything, I'll give Joe Biden credit for being able to, over the past couple of weeks, sit there and say, we can do this. We can come together. And I think we have to count on Joe trying to see if he can pull those pieces together. When I look at some of his cabinet choices, I'm going, no, I'm not too crazy about them. On the other hand, do I really care? How much does who he picks to be secretary of whatever matter to me on a day-to-day -day basis? It doesn't. What matters to me is where are we on the economy? We had almost 160 million people employed before the pandemic. We had good interracial. I don't even like to get into the race thing. I, I've been going to school with people of color since I was in elementary school, which is the 50s, okay? So I, I don't see that racial difference in the same way maybe other people my age, my race, but we keep coming back to that. And that does bother me, that we, we almost want to make an issue of that issue instead of moving past it and looking at what's happening and can we work together from that standpoint. I look at it almost like a birthday party that you've been invited to and you don't like all the other people that are there. Well, guess what? You're not there for the other people. You're there for the person who invited you to the birthday party. That's where we need to be with the country being the birthday party. Not Joe Biden, not Ms. Harris, not Nancy Pelosi, not Mitch McConnell, right. the country. Right. Um, uh, Ken, thank you so much. I want to bring Robert in. Robert, where in the country are you as we speak? Mr. Watson, I am in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. I can oh. see New York City from my window. I, I love it. And I can even hear it in the accent. So, Robert, it's nice to see you. And uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, Robert, in, oh, in, you. If, if you can, in 30 seconds, Tell me why you voted for President Trump. I voted for uh, President Trump because I kind of got like a personal thing with him. I'm in the trucking business. I, uh, I, I grew up idolizing him uh, when I was younger in, in the streets of the garment center. Uh, I used to see him walk around or, or talk or, you know, and, and, and I, you know, of course, I'm a young guy. I'm in business. I, I, I wanted to, you know, make the millions that he was making. I, I you know, I, I, I saw somebody who, who believed in what he said. I mean, I heard him on the Howard Stern show. You know, it was just he said what he wanted to say when he wanted to say it. And I, and I, and I was like, oh, that's great. And I was never into politics. And, 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 and another reason uh, is because we need some tough people or something different. You know how he talked about draining the swamp and all that stuff? I just was hoping, oh, let's get somebody who's who's going to do things. But of course, 
half the time it was craziness, and then the other half of the time there was a lot of great things that he did. So I, I you know, I could I could go on for an hour, but you only gave me thirty seconds. I only gave you thirty seconds, but I appreciate, it. Robert. One last quick question: Have you ever voted for a Democrat for uh, president before, or have you have well, you always been a consistent Republican voter? Well, that's the, that's the thing. I, 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 my first president that I voted for, which I think is the greatest president ever, is was Ronald Reagan. You, you oh, so, so you've been, so straight down the line, you've been, and then quickly, Ken, you the same? Have you always voted Republicans for uh, president? Uh oh, you might be on mute. Now I'm now I'm off. Am I back on? Yep, you're back on. Okay, I voted for Barack Obama. Uh, I voted for Democrats in the past. I'm an NPA. I vote more for the person than for the party. Uh, Democrats haven't shown me much in the past, too. Fair enough. And, Leah, you get the final quick word here, and then we got to go quickly. Have you voted for Democrats in the past, or have you been a consistent Republican presidential voter thus far? I have been a consistent Republican voter thus far. Voted in... Um two major elections now a little bit a little bit on the younger side but i'll get there you know what we have we have we have some good uh, distribution on this panel i want to thank all of you guys ken robert lee and thank you guys for being so kind to join me uh, uh what an interesting moment we're in as a country uh ken i'm gonna remember what you said about the birthday party and uh, uh robert i'm gonna find you on the garment streets uh out there in new york and new jersey when i get out there again and Leah, South Carolina has been a, a good place uh, over the years for me. My cousin got married there, so I always have, have good thoughts about that part of the world. So thank you guys all uh, uh, for joining us today. Um, as we look back at today's inauguration and look ahead to the next administration, we're also acutely aware of events that may be happening in real time all across the country. And so now it's time for a bit of an Aussie check-in. I'm really pleased to, join our to ask our senior politics reporter, Nick Foriezos, who's on the ground in Washington, D.C., to join us. Uh, Nick, what is the feeling right now, a couple of hours after uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris got sworn in in the Capitol? Is it quiet? Is there excitement? I clearly see it's dark where you are. You're still looking good, but it's a little dark there. Uh, what's the mood like uh, there in D.C.? Carlos, I think it's a bit of a sigh of relief. Um, whether you're Republican or Democrat, no one wanted to see any violence. No one wanted to see any chaos. And, uh, you know, none of it came true. So uh, that's the positive. Obviously, you can see you know, I'm outside the Capitol here and there are still barricades. And I hear that they might be here for quite a while longer. So there is that. But other than that, it's, it, it was a quiet day and you did not see as many people uh, show up as you might have thought. Um, MAGA protests did not happen. Uh, you know, Republicans didn't, didn't rally. And uh, also Democrats didn't. Uh, I heard from the ground that uh, Black Lives Matter protesters and our uh, leaders, organizers, as well as other organizers uh, here in D.C. actually asked people to stay home because they didn't want to ramp up any tensions that might emerge. And that's what we saw today. Just a few, maybe a couple hundred people out kind of on the other side of the street and on the barricade, but really uh, a quiet a quiet day. And I think everyone was, uh, saw that as a relief. You know, Nick, I'm going to ask you to play historian a little bit because, you know, you and I have worked together now for almost five years uh, you covered the 2016 campaign. You were one of the first people late in the campaign when all the other experts were telling me that Trump had no chance. You were one of the few people who told me, hey, hang on a second. I understand the polls are saying one thing, but my eyes are telling me another. How are you going to look back on this, do you think, a decade from now, two decades from now, the Trump era? Uh, do you expect to look on it as an aberration? Do you expect to look on it as, as a kickoff to a larger cultural fight that extended for several decades? How do you expect that you're going to look back on the last four years? You know, that's really difficult. And maybe if we had more hindsight than just today, I'd, I'd have a better answer. But I'll, I'll start by just saying that, you know, I was able to tell uh, even back then that the country was a little bit too divided for it to be a runaway election. And I didn't tell you Trump was going to win. But you know, what I did tell you is that, you know, my mom's side is conservative Catholic and Southern from Georgia. My dad's side was Greek, liberal, Jewish, Canadian, and crazy. And, uh, you know, having those perspectives and seeing that, it made it very clear to me as I travel the country, too, that, uh, you know, we have differences in opinion. And there are still 74 million people who did vote for Trump or against Biden, depending on how you view it. Now, are all those 74 million people the kind of people who stormed the Capitol? Absolutely not. And so I think it has to be an interesting conversation about how we move forward 
And, uh, you know, when we look back on this time, I hope it's a, a time of, you know, of uh, we look back at it and we're like, maybe the country was under duress, but uh, we came together afterward. Uh, I can't say that I'm confident about it. And my biggest concern is the way that online news, online media, uh, but particularly, um, you know, social media, uh, the way it is used and abused by people in power to manipulate. Uh, and as long as that exists, I think we have to be very careful about how we consume uh, media and also making sure that um, you know, we base our conversation in mutual trust, respect, and a common ground on uh, you know, reason and logic as kind of the underlying aspect of what we base our discourse on. Uh, that's going to be you, 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 going forward. Yeah. You know, Nick, I bet you you're right. And I bet you that one of the first things we will see the Biden administration tackle will be some kind of regulation around social media. And uh, and I think much in the way that we've saw the uh, FCC put limits over the years on television and cable news, I wouldn't be surprised to see the government step in and there might be bipartisan support. Talk about one of the areas for unity. There could be bipartisan support for the notion that uh, whether it be Twitter or Facebook or others, that there may be some kind of limitations uh, on there. Um, Nick, I may leave it there for now, but thank you so much. Please stay safe out there. And I wanna have more conversations about some of the people that you think we should be keeping our eye on as we go forward into this new era. Because you know we think about that uh, young, the first inaugural poet, the youngest inaugural poet who you and I met her when she was an 18 year old Aussie Genius Award winner, Amanda Gorman. And I think that she is just a sign of all the new faces and new talent to come, um, which um, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we'll, see, we'll meet and see lots of good people. Um, all right, we're going to uh, leave it there. Um, if you're just tuning in, you're watching a special live inaugural edition of the Carlos Watson Show right now. Uh, we've been having a terrific conversation, real wide range of people from uh, Dr. Christina Greer from Fordham to Megan Kelly, from Don Baer to our own Nick Foriezos. Now I'm pleased to introduce another panel conversation which takes a deep look at our traditional two-party system and poses a little bit of a provocative question. Do we need a bigger table? Are we a nation firmly divided by as many as four parties, not two? Traditional Republicans, Trump supporters, moderate kind of Biden Democrats, and progressive AOC Democrats. The question that we're asking, put another way, is are four parties better than two? I would hope that liberals and conservatives can agree to disagree and be friendly with one another, and we don't have our political beliefs be the litmus test for friendship. In terms of founding principles, you know, I think the idea of egalitarian democracy, um, I think that's just the bottom line, that everyone deserves an equal chance to participate in uh, determining the destiny of the state. You, you just saw Fox News contributor Tommy Lahren and acclaimed author and journalist Ta-Nehisi Coates weigh in. Now joining the conversation, we welcome the former campaign manager uh, for Secretary Hillary Clinton, Patty Solis Doyle, and singer, songwriter, and author of kick-ass conservative Joy Via. Uh, welcome both of you to the show. It's, it's good to see you, Patty. Joy, it's good to see you as well. Good to see Thank you. Good to be here. Um, uh, Patty, I'm going to start with you. Time to move to four parties instead of two. Time to open this thing up in this uh, big, sprawling country of ours. Well, you know, maybe. I mean, I think Trump already said that he's going to start his own party, the Patriot Party, uh, another offshoot of the Republican Party. Uh, I don't know if he's actually going to do that, but, you know, I, I over the last four years, actually six years, I've learned that when he says something, he usually does do it. So uh, that's going to be really interesting. Um, if he does do that and there's two uh, factions of the Republican Party, I think that's going to be really good for Democrats because I really don't think that the Democratic Party is going to, um, is as fractured to, to come up with another a party, another Democratic Party. Um, look, for sure, um, Biden is going to have some political realities to contend with uh, on the left, and they're going to expect him to do some big things, whether that's on climate or whether that's on immigration or whether that's on, um, you know, taxes. They're going to expect him to do some big things. But I think first and foremost, um, for the first time I've seen in a long time, the Democratic Party was very much united in this election because their North Star, our North Star, my North Star was uh, defeating Trump. 
And so you didn't see a whole lot of fracturing on the on the Democratic side. But now that Biden's elected, who knows? It, it may um, it may become more divisive. And, and Joy, you were a strong supporter of former President Trump, yes? Joy, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you might have lost me. Can you hear oh, me okay? I can hear you okay. So, Joy, if former President Trump does start his own party, would okay. you leave the Republicans and would you join a Trumplican party? <laughs> well, it's funny because that's actually the book. how I escaped liberal feminism to become a freedom-loving Trumplican. So I've always been a Trumplican. I've never been a Republican, even though I'm registered as a Republican. Uh oh, now. Uh, Patty, I think we're having a little bit of a tough connection uh, with Joy. Um, uh, Patty, what happens? Do you think when AOC and others, a couple years into it? Say this is serious. We can't. Can you hear me okay? Um, Joy, we can hear you just a bit. Joy, you're saying you always were a Trumplican, and you and if the president, former president, were to start his own party, uh, you'd be uh, you'd be recruit number one. I would be absolutely. I mean, I already said that about my book. It's sorry that I'm having some issues, Wi-Fi wise. Hopefully, you can see this, but uh, my book act actually talks about being a Trumplican. Um, even though I am a Republican, it I feel a, a bit of dissatisfaction with my party. And I got to say, the first person of color uh, who was a VP was Republican Charles Curtis in 1929, who was Native American. So it's a big deal. But, um, you know, Kamala is not the first person of color. Uh, um, Joy, you just went out. I'm going to bring Patty in uh, for a moment. Um, uh Patty, what do you think would happen? Because you and I both remember when Ross Perot ran, and that was, that was a serious run. And remember, he's a guy who, as you and I know, he ran, he was number one in the polls, ahead of Papa Bush and uh, candidate Bill Clinton, dropped out, came back in, chose a not great vice presidential candidate, had crazy moments, and still got 20% of the vote. So... It, are we actually being naive uh, to think that that in this more digital, more fluid era, that we won't see more Ross Perot-like candidates who will be like, damn it, I don't need to be a Democrat or Republican. I don't want to be a Democrat or Republican. I want to be my own thing. Are we naive to not think that we'll see that kind of candidate in 2024 and beyond? I think we may see a candidate like that, but we're still a, a pretty far off uh, place from that kind of party getting the kind of resources they need. You know, you know, um, the money, the people, the backing, it's gonna take a while before something like that, a, a candidate like that can sort of reach the same level of um, resources and backing in order to make a serious run. 20% is, is, is okay, but it's not enough to win you an election. But, I, you know, with someone like AOC, however, you know, I'm a huge fan of hers. She is a first, well now she's gonna be a second term uh, member of Congress, but the kind of power and the kind of name recognition and the kind of fundraising she has access to, that gives me pause. I think someone like her, a leader uh, who can break off from the Democratic party and start her own party, I would be interested to see something like that. I would, I would be interested to see if she can pull it off. If anybody can, I think she can. You know, that is such a fascinating notion, Patty. And for whatever reason, I was not, uh, I, didn't, I didn't think about AOC, but you're right. She certainly could raise the kind of money you need. She certainly has the name ID. You could clearly say that that would be very intriguing to see someone like that. Who else is on that list? I mean, what about your boy, Bill Clinton, uh, not Bill Clinton, but Bill Gates? You know, if someone like Gates were to jump in or any of these kind of tech titans who really have, you know, enormous sums of money. And so the idea of funding a billion or $2 billion, as crazy as it sounds, they certainly could do it. You think that there's there there? And obviously on the flip side is your boy, Michael Bloomberg, who got knocked out with the, uh, you know, by a good Warren left hook. Well, I was about to say, we had a couple of self-funders uh, in 2020 on the Democratic side, and they didn't fare too well. Uh, Mike Bloomberg, uh, you know, 
among them. I think people want to see, uh, I think voters want to see their candidates work for it and earn the votes and not just throw money at it. Uh, and that's why AOC, in, in my opinion, can be very appealing because she has worked, she's, she's worked for it. You know, she, she knocked on every door in um, her district and she came out of nowhere and nobody thought she was going to, nobody thought she was going to win. And that video of her learning when she won that night is just priceless. So I think, I don't, I think self-funders uh, really can't uh, make the kind of moves that we're talking about. Uh, Patty Salise Doyle, uh, really nice to have you. Thank you as always uh, for joining me and, 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 you know, just what an interesting year already. And uh, uh, here's to good things in 2021. All right, now we're going to welcome uh, uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters uh, from Southern California. Congresswoman Waters, nice to see you again. Good to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. It, it is totally my pleasure. I'm still remembering our wonderful conversation. I don't know if you remember it, but I do from a month or two ago, and you telling me what the athlete that you were back in the day in, uh, in Missouri and that, that competitive fire. I, you, you don't know how many people I've been telling about, you know, beware of former athletes named Maxine and what they may do. So I, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, get to see you uh, on this day. And congratulations. I know you worked very hard for the Biden-Harris ticket. So uh, I'm assuming you're feeling good on this inauguration day. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I thought that um, I would certainly be happy, but I didn't know I was really going to be thrilled. <laughs> and it turned out I was just thrilled. Uh, to see, you know, the uh, celebration and to see Kamala Harris. I've known her for quite some time. And, you know, just to see her having, you know, gotten to be the first woman and the first vice president, woman vice president of the United States was, was it was more than I could really digest. I was overcome by it. So it's been a wonderful day. Yes. Yeah. I, I imagine it's one of those things that intellectually you knew would matter, but when you probably actually saw her there, I saw so many uh, people touched uh, in different ways. Congressman Waters, what would tell you that this new administration was off to a good start? How would you know? Because you've seen many, many new administrations come in, and you know when someone's on track, when they're not off track. A hundred days in, a year in, what will be true that will tell you, you know what, this is going to be a strong administration that may have a chance at two terms? Well, one of the things I think uh, may be misunderstood and not understood is the kind of experience that Biden brings uh, to this presidency. He really understands government and he understands it at several different levels. You know, having been in the Senate for so long and been in the leadership and then, you know, being the vice president of the United States, he understands the relationships and what it means in order to, you know, uh, get something done. So I'm very, very uh, confident uh, that if anybody can, you know, create the kind of relationships or go back and pick up on the relationships they've had in order to, you know, forge the kind of uh, legislation uh, that it's going to take in order to get some things done, that he certainly can do it. And of course, you saw Kamala uh, when she hit the Senate and you saw how she uh, was able to use her skills uh, to question, you know, some of the witnesses who came. And so we're not talking about novices here. Uh, we're not talking about people who don't understand uh, government, how it works, and what relationships mean. So I, I feel pretty good uh, that they're going to be able to get things done. And what I like so much is they have been talking basically from a progressive perspective. And so I'm... Uh, I'm confident that we're going to be able to uh, get some things done that, of course, we've wanted to have done for so long. I want to tell you, uh, you know, having, you know, been in this country uh, with the burden on my shoulder of, uh, you know, having to endure the president of the United States has been quite a burden. And so I feel almost as if, you know, this burden has been lifted and that uh, I can, you know, appreciate you know, a lot of things that I've just forgotten about because I want to tell you, uh, this president had gotten away with so much that I never thought would happen in America because I thought patriotism would overcome anything 
uh, but it did not. And he was able to spend four years having, you know, uh, done some of the most atrocious things that I would never expect from anybody, let alone the president of the United States. So I am uh, optimistic. And I'm feeling very good and very hopeful. And so um, I'm looking forward to working with them. We're not going to agree on everything. But here's one of the things that I decided, that I am going to give this president and this vice president every chance. And even when I disagree, I'm not going to disagree readily. And I'm not going to disagree uh, over things that I could say, okay, I'll put that aside for now. And that's a little bit different from my personality, uh, but I'm going to try. And, and, and final question <laughs> for you, Congresswoman Waters, because I, that's so interesting hearing you talk about that pragmatic patience. Do you think that some of your younger colleagues, I'm thinking about uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, uh, I'm thinking about Congresswoman uh, Omar, I'm thinking about Congresswoman Presley. Yana Pre uh, Presley. And, and yeah, I'm, do you think that they will have they that they will, yeah? Do you think they will want to be those pragmatic, um, patient uh, uh, collaborators as well, or do you think that they will feel the fierce urgency of now? And do you think that they will be more active? I don't want to say critics, but but more active um, challengers of the Biden Harris administration right out of the gate. Well, you know, I do think that they are committed to a progressive proposition. And they've had the opportunity to work with uh, Trump and his administration, and they will see the difference. And I don't know what that's going to do in terms of how they're going to approach, you know, the things that they want to see happen. But I think there will be a great difference in having, you know, the representatives from uh, the agencies that come before us and being able, you know, to question them and to, you know, really get hard on them. It's going to be different when you see uh, the representatives from all of our agencies that are Democratic that are coming before us. It'll be a, a difference in how you deal with them. So let's see what that does. It's going to take, um, you know, a little experience. But uh, I think that they are certainly good people on the right track. Uh, they're idealistic, and that's wonderful. And they want to get progressive things done. So let's let's give them an opportunity uh, to learn a little bit more about the difference between these administrations and how to approach it. Uh, Congresswoman Waters, it is always uh, wonderful to see you. I'm super grateful that you came on, and uh, I hope you have a, a safe and good end to the week. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for having me anytime. I'd love to be on with you again. I look forward to it. Be safe. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're now going to welcome our next panel of Aussie subscribers. Now, this one is made up of people who did not vote either for Joe Biden or Donald Trump during the last presidential election. We thought it would actually be great to kind of uh, further this conversation about the party system in our country uh, with folks who weren't on any particular side of the aisle. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, please allow me to welcome Adele Bradley, uh, Catherine Yokovic, and uh, Sam Frangioni to the show. Hi. Hi there. Um, Ad, um, nice to see all of you. Um, uh, Adele, I'm going to start with you. Um, Adele, what did you do in the 2020 election? Did you not vote? Did you vote for someone other than the two? Give me a give me a quick I, sense of what you did. Yes, I, I chose not to vote. I did not vote. Um, there are a few things that um, led to that decision of not being able to vote at this time. Um, there was a prior convention um, that was in 2005 that um, basically it has me to presume my promise of 2022 when I'm able to actually be able to get out there in the community and vote. So yeah, oh, so I um, did not vote this year, but I did stay active or proactive, um, especially with the 2020 election. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, you know, Adele, that's interesting. That could be one of the uh, uh, dramatic changes that happens over the next four years is is changes in uh, our election laws and our voter laws, uh, whether it's people who previously couldn't vote because of, of records or whether uh, it's access to the polls or other things. So uh, an interesting issue there. Catherine, um, why did you not vote for uh, Biden or, or Trump? Well, um I'm registered as a Republican, but um, the last two presidential elections, I have chosen to vote third party because I feel that the Republican Party has moved quite a bit from, especially Trump, 
uh, from what I value and I'm looking for in a president. And Catherine, did you, no. did, you, did you consider at any point voting for Biden or Biden wasn't a possibility? I did, but I felt that although I do support some of his policies, there's certain things that I am not on board with. And, and, and Catherine, if you don't mind me asking, who did you ultimately cast your ballot for? I voted for the independence candidate. That's great. And Sam, what about you? What did you do in, in 2020? Uh, did you did you vote for a third party? Did you not vote at all? Yep. Uh, so I did vote uh, third party. I ended up voting for the libertarian candidate, Joe Jorgensen. And, and Sam, what made you not vote for either Biden or Trump or maybe said in the affirmative, what made you vote for the libertarian candidate? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, it was probably more the two candidates that were presented with President Trump and now President Biden, I think, took me to a place in the options. Uh, I'm probably more uh, conservative in, in my uh, in my stances normally, uh, more Republican uh, with my morals and things like that. However, with Trump and how he kind of presented himself over the last four years, and even in his initial um, campaign that kind of led me to explore my options. So I did explore Biden as, a, as an option as well, but as I did my research and what my convictions kind of led me to, that's what led me to, to end up voting for the libertarian candidate, Joe Jorgensen. Got it. Well, Adele, Catherine, Sam, I'm sorry that I'm cutting it so short, but I really appreciate hearing from you. This was such a dramatic and interesting election. I think our highest turnout in nearly a century. And so I'm, um, I'm intrigued by people who who didn't go with the 81 million who voted for Biden and didn't go for the 74 million uh, who voted for uh, uh, former President Trump and, and went a different way. And I hope that you guys will stay in touch and we can uh, see where things turn out for you guys in 2024 and beyond. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, if you're just joining us, uh, welcome to the Inauguration After Show. It's a special live edition of the Carlos Watson Show. We've been having a terrific conversation. We're calling it the People's Conversation. Uh, everyone from uh, Dr. Christina Greer and Don Baer to uh, Representative Maxine Waters and Megan Kelly, just a fantastic conversation. Next up, we're going to continue to look at the Biden-Harris administration and their first 100 days. We're calling this segment No Excuses, and you know why, because not only does Biden have the White House, but he's got the Senate narrowly, and he's got the House. We've got to make sure we don't forget what we've been through and we make investments in the science that would allow us to respond. My goal was to uh, suggest that there are a lot of innovations, including in vaccines, that he could bring his name and his influence to bear on, things like a universal flu vaccine, an HIV vaccine. And I did bring up pandemics at that time. Unfortunately, I wasn't persuasive enough. Uh, that did not become a priority for the US government. In fact, some of the work in that area actually got uh, de-staffed. So I'll try again. Uh, we've got new leadership coming in and I think President Biden will be more open to this working with the world to cut down diseases and being ready for the next pandemic. All right, there you have it. A couple heavy hitters joining the show. That was Dr. Anthony Fauci and, of course, Bill Gates, who need no formal introduction. Uh, we're now turning to a different part of the conversation here. I'm pleased to welcome uh, a different panel as we talk a little bit uh, about where we are here. Um, Grover Norquist uh, joins us, uh, leader of the Americans for Tax Reform, longtime uh, conservative leader. Uh, John Fort, uh, CNBC uh, anchor, and uh, Francesca Paletta, a professor and author. Uh, really excited to have all of you on the show. Uh, John, let me start with you. Uh, number one, what did you see in the inauguration today? And number two, what's your expectation uh, going forward in a world in which Joe Biden, Washington veteran, not only has the presidency, but has a narrow uh, majority in the Senate and has uh, a narrow majority in the House? Well, Carlos, uh, we've been talking a lot about hope and possibility. So I want to lead with that. Uh, I definitely did see that. Um, but, but I also saw a locked down capital. Uh, and I saw America in a state uh, of being huddled and un unsure. I think uh, there was an attempt to project normalcy 
and project and protect tradition. But then at the same time, there's this question of when we open up again, and as a democracy, we must, these barricades can't remain uh, in place forever. How will these passions that have been stoked that led us to this moment influence the legislators uh, and other politicians to react against this idea of unity? So I think realistically, this is a big challenging moment. And uh, even though you can say party-wise, yes, the Democrats have the executive branch in both houses of Congress narrowly, the degree to which there really is one Democratic Party, which is a theme that you've been touching on in the show thus far, I think is is in question. I don't think we're going to end up with a multiple party system formally. I don't think it's set up for that. But uh, I don't know that there's unity even within parties at this point. Um, Francesca Paletta, I want to bring you in because you and I have talked before uh, about the different ways people communicate in these kind of tumultuous and transitional uh, times. And certain kind of language can be more effective. Certain kinds of approaches can be more effective. What do you expect of a Biden-Harris administration? What advice, if any, uh, would you give them as they face, again, a number of real challenges from obviously the health crisis to the economy to international issues? Um, we live in a deeply polarized nation. I think that's clear. And the, the solution that's often offered is that we need to talk with one another one-on-one, -on -one, share our stories, develop empathy, recognize that there, there is more that makes us similar than divides us. I would argue that our leaders have an incredibly important role to play in combating the polarization we face, that it should come as much from the top down as the bottom up. And so I think you see uh, President Biden beginning to do that today, uh, to talk about what joins us as Americans. I would argue that what joins us is as much our diversity as our similarity, uh, that what joins us is our commitment to democracy as much as the ways in which we're the same. I think the president can both talk about the ties that bind in a compelling way and can pass the kind of legislation, can make the kind of policy uh, that meets Americans where they are, that, that responds to Americans' needs. As Representative Waters said, uh, President Biden is a skilled politician. Uh, and I hope that he'll be not just the empathizer in chief, but also the pragmatist in chief, that he'll work to get some of the legislation passed that we need. Uh, Grover, I want to bring you in here. Uh, uh, you've been following presidential administrations uh, uh, for a number of years. You and I have talked in the past about Reagan's approach uh, to the office, Papa Bush's approach to the office, uh, obviously W's approach to the office. If you were guiding uh, Joe Biden, the 46th commander in chief, what would you tell him? Would you tell him to go hard and heavy and try to really get um, you know, a handful of his key priorities across? Would you tell him go slower and try and partner uh, with Republicans on the other side of the aisle? What would you, what would you be advising uh, the 46th commander in chief here? Well, he's not taking advice. He's already made the decision. You saw in his speech, he talked about unity and every issue he talked about, he already has a very partisan Democrat piece of legislation that he's already endorsed and said he's going to pass. Um, so you can talk about unity, but he wants to pass the uh, PRO Act, which would ban independent contractors, uh, freelance workers, Uber, Lyft, uh, any number of freelance, millions and millions of freelance workers. Uh, he wants to do things to the labor, a lot of, to ban right to work laws, the PRO Act. Um, and that would make 27 states, if, but the, right now you don't have to join a union if you want to, if you'd like to, you can, you don't have to. His law would say, yes, you do. And you have to pay dues as well, by the way. Um, so he's taken a, position that on every significant issue, what do you do about climate change, raise taxes on people's energy so that poor people will use less of it because rich people use as much as they want anyway, um, that are very highly partisan. And he's doing exactly what Clinton did. And Clinton lost the House and the Senate in two years when people said, you didn't tell us about these taxes on the middle class and energy. You, you said you were going to do that. Uh, and exactly what Obama did when he said he wasn't going to raise taxes on the middle class, and Obamacare had quite a number of them, uh, and the spending. Uh, and Biden is making the same decision. He's going to go in and, and try and put in as much of the Democrat agenda as he can. And there are millions of Americans out there who were never told that he hated independent contractors, but he has endorsed 
the bill in California, which was defeated, the constitutional amendment that would have destroyed independent contractors in California. Uh, and he has endorsed uh, doing that nationally. So he will create his own opposition because while he talks about unity, I mean, there's some pieces of legislation theoretically that you could work on. President Trump did, I, we were working for years and years on criminal justice reform and trying to get the 100 to 1 ratio on crack cocaine to powder cocaine down to 19, 19, 18 to 1. Um, and that took a lot of time. Trump came and actually did that with the uh, criminal justice reform issue. Biden could have led with one of those ideas. Uh, we haven't seen that yet on the big ticket items, strictly partisan. And remember, the Republicans have 30 states where they have both houses of legislature and 24 or 25 where they have both houses of legislature and the governor. At the state, the Republicans did extremely well in this election. Trump lost. He was three points behind the Republicans in the House. OK, so when you talk about Trump and the Republicans, the House Republicans got better votes and the Senate Republicans got higher votes than Trump did. Uh, and you're looking at a very strong Republican Party. It's 50-50 in the Senate. It was 60-40 when Obama was there until uh, Ted Kennedy passed away. That's 60 Democrat votes. Now they have 50. So it's a much tighter close. And the Republicans in the House are within about seven votes with right. another six congressional districts moving into Republican Texas, Florida, other out of Democrat states into Republican states. So the redistricting daily cause, the more left of center group, says the Democrats have lost the House for a decade because of that. So it's it's a very challenging thing where the Republican Party is significantly stronger than they were under Obama or under um, Clinton. And what the President Biden wants to do is much more radical in terms of size of the spending bills and size of the tax bills and massive labor law changes that if you're an independent contractor, you're just screwed. Nobody told them that was going to happen. Those Rover, 10, 11 million people, how do they vote two years from now? So it's going to be very Rover, let me. Sorry, Grover, yeah. let me bring in John for a moment. Um, John, it's interesting. I'm hearing Grover uh, talk a lot about business and the economy. You obviously covered a lot on Squawk Alley. You know, so often you would assume that the markets and business might have some hesitation, not only about a Democratic president, but about a Democratic president, House and Senate. And yet we're seeing stock market records and highs. What are we to take uh, from that? Will, will, will business be an ally, do you think, broadly speaking, for, uh, for Joe Biden in his first year and his first term? Carlos, it's so hard to read. Market is really saying, I mean, actually, uh, market performance, stock market performance under Democratic presidents um, traditionally has been stronger uh, than Republican presidents. But I, I don't know exactly how much you can read into that either. And so much of what the market's doing right now has to do with the Fed uh, and has to do with interest rates and uh, you know, the idea that there aren't a lot of different options on where you can put your money uh, if, if you want your money to go to work for you. But I think uh, one of the things that a President Biden has going for him is this idea of stability. Uh, the, the economy, along many metrics, did very well under the Trump administration, but CEOs were always afraid of you know, what was going to come in a tweet that might affect them personally, might affect their business specifically, might affect their employees and overall sentiment, brand America, et cetera. They're less concerned about that now. But Grover has a point, certainly when it comes to uh, the impact on independent contractors, some of the flexibility uh, in labor, talk about raising the minimum wage, you're not gonna get unanimous excitement in the business community along all of those lines about all of those things. So I think, I think there's goodwill but there's a reason why it's said that business likes divided government, right? Because it's a little bit easier to control the outcomes or at least avoid a, a radical outcome of your business. And if your business, you, you, if you're already a big, big business, you did pretty well on what was happening already. You don't necessarily want uh, big dramatic changes. Um, Francesca, I want to bring you in here because you and I had a very interesting conversation a week or two ago. We were talking a little bit about race and some of your research. Uh, because one, of, you know, we not only will end up talking about the economy, we not only will end up talking about COVID, but but we know that um, there were major protests around Black Lives Matter uh, last year. We're going to see them again, and you were talking about uh, what happens when you try and sometimes talk to different racial audiences about the same ma matter, and what may be the best way to go about it. In one case, may may fail. In another case, do you want to say more 
about how you envision the challenge for Joe Biden on matters of racial justice and racial reckoning? Well, I think a number of uh, a number of your guests have referred to it, right, is that Joe Biden's opportunity is to uh, create the kind of policies that will uh, unify Americans, but at the same time to pursue the progressive agenda uh, that we elected him on. Um, it's threading a needle. needle. It will be difficult. Uh, but I think, in, you know, in response to Grover's point, that there are a number of number of issues that have been coded as partisan ones that may not necessarily square with public opinion. For example, the majority of Americans support sensible gun legislation. They support um, a path to citizenship. So there are a lot of issues where there is some potential for moving them from strict Democratic or Republican issues. That's interesting. You use that word uh, uh, sensible there. And so it also could in, be in the packaging and the framework. Grover, I'm going to give you the final word here, uh, final 30 seconds here. Uh, if you could get um, uh, Biden, the Biden-Harris team to work on one big bipartisan package, what would that be? What would you, if you I know you mentioned criminal justice reform and maybe that's it, but if not, what would be the number one uh, topic that you would love to see them work on uh, with Republicans in 2021. Utah, Senator Lee and Coons out of Delaware have a bill that will help states move away from taking away your driver's license because you haven't paid your parking tickets or speeding fines. Eight states have now done that. Uh, I think that's something that could move nationally with bipartisan uh, support. And Neil of uh, Massachusetts has a bill that would make it easier for people to start 401ks and IRAs for smaller businesses and would get millions more Americans. One of the challenges with the wealth gap is that Social Security is pretend savings. Nobody gets any wealth when Social Security taxes are taken away. You put money in a 401k or an IRA, you build wealth for your family and for your future. So making that available to more small businesses, that has bipartisan support as well. Biden's got a bill that goes the other direction, but the Congress, I think, would be very happy with uh, Neil's bill, and I think Republicans would as well. Uh, Francesca Paletta, Grover Norquist, John Ford, thank you all for joining me today. I hope you guys will come back. It'll be interesting to see where we are 100 days in. I hope for all of us uh, that we're all in a better place, uh, including the vaccine uh, being more effectively rolled out. Thank, thank you to all three of you for joining. All right, let's extend the conversation on the new administration's first 100 days by welcoming a few Aussie subscribers not those who voted for President Trump, as we talked to at the beginning of the conversation, nor those who didn't vote for Trump or Biden. But this time around, I want to talk to people who did indeed vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. That's right. Our viewers join the conversation now. Uh, Tanisha Matthews, Hunter Griffin, and Braylon Lee, uh, welcome to the show. Good to see all of you. Good to see you, Carl. Good to see you, everybody. Um, Tanisha, I'm going to start with you. Where, where in this wonderful country are you today? I am in um, Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. So, so Georgia's yeah. been doing a lot of work. You guys have been busy. You guys didn't uh, go to sleep after uh, yes. after November. Um, I, I could guess, Tanisha, but I want to put it in your words. Give me 30 seconds. How are you feeling today on this day of inauguration? Oh my goodness, today um, it was very heartfelt. You know, I feel um, inspired by Biden and Kamala, you know, just everything, um, just looking forward from everything that we've been through over the last four years. And, you know, it's just been surreal for me being an African American woman and just seeing firsthand just the hate and everything that has um, transpired. But I'm very optimistic, you know, about everything moving forward. You know, I just want to see this country unify and us just getting back to some type of normalcy of being decent and respecting each other and um, just showing love to each other. Um, Hunter, where are you right now as we speak? Where in the country are you? Hi, right, Carlos. Thanks for having me. I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona this afternoon. So, oh, so we we focus on swing state people here today. So you and Tanisha both are responsible for uh, for part of that uh, Biden victory. Hunter, what are you seeing there in in Arizona, which was another tight race decided by only a few thousand votes? 
Um, is there optimism? Is there frustration? Does it feel divided when I, I know we obviously are kind of all being a little bit COVID restrictive, but, but what are you feeling there in Phoenix, Arizona? Here in Arizona, when it comes to COVID, we've been pretty relaxed about that. That's just our libertarian leanings. Uh, really, the thing to pay attention to is our GOP at the state level. Um, we're starting to see a lot of the infighting and uh, a lot of the questions of which direction are we going to go in as a party. Um, so watching the Republican Party there and kind of their talking points is going to be pretty interesting as far as moving forward. And, and Braylon, where are you as we speak right now? Well, I am in Kent, Ohio, but before I say my answer, I just want to say to Ali and Robert and to you, thank you guys for your kindness, your graciousness and everything. Um, I know I don't have to be here. So the fact that I'm even here, I definitely appreciate it. So you, you were kind to say that and you were kind to be here and we're, we're lucky to have you. So thank you uh, for joining us uh, today. I'm, I'm an Ohio native. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. So uh, there, uh, so, go. Oh, there you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, uh, Raylan, so, so where is your head and where is your heart right now? What would make you feel good about Biden's first 100 days or his first year? What would tell you that things were on track? I always say planning is one thing, execution is another. So I think the planning, the execution, and the engagement, I think those are going to be the three things that are going to really tell me that they're moving forward because you can have an administration that does a lot of things, but if you're not engaging with the people that are going to be affected by the things that you do, it's not going to work. I have a quote that says, anybody be a gift, a present to entertain you, it takes a somebody to be a gift to bless you. So we have to get past being entertaining in these temporary gifts and get and get to the point of being a gift where when we give something to somebody it actually blesses them, not just for a moment, but for the actual experience for, of their life. So, mm. um, Tanisha, let me ask you about uh, uh, President Biden. You know, uh, one of our early contributors pointed out that he's extremely experienced, uh, which was French for he's a little bit older than many of our presidents. He's the oldest ever elected uh, president, 78 years old. Uh, obviously, the Speaker of the House uh, is in her 80s. Uh, the leader of the Senate is in his 70s. Uh, much of the Supreme Court is in their 70s and 80s. Is there any part of you that, even though you voted for Biden, has some concern about his ability to handle such a rigorous, aggressive job? I mean, you saw Bill Clinton today, who's younger than Biden, kind of taking a nap you know, in the middle of inauguration. And so, you know, it's it's a real thing. Is there any of you that's got any any hesitations when it comes to uh, the new president? Um, I would say I have faith in him because he does have the experience. You know, he's been on the hill for many years, I would say. And it's a lot of, you know, individuals around him that can assist him and help him um, with plans moving forward. But, you know, I would say a lot of um, the individuals there are kind of on the older side. So it would be nice, I guess, sometime in the future to see younger individuals there, you know, who have um, more ideas, you know, moving forward, I would say. Yes. Thank you. Well, Tanisha Hunter and Braylon, I'm going to let all of you go, but I'm very appreciative of your time. Uh, uh, what an important conversation. I hope that you will uh, stay in touch. And I may ask you to come back 100 days in because we may do a 100 day check in and we may see where the new president, the new vice president are then. Uh, um, uh, thank you all, Braylon, uh, Tanisha, Hunter. Uh, be well, be safe. Have a uh, have a good January. Absolutely. Thank Looking you. forward thank to you so it, Carlos. Thank you. All right. Right now, it's time for another Aussie check in. This time, we're going to go to our boots on the ground editor and reporter. He's in the Capitol, but this time the capital of North Carolina. Raleigh, want to get a real-time update from our own senior editor, Daniel Malloy. Uh, Daniel, how are you? Uh, good to see you. Great to see you, Carlos. I'm doing well. Um, Daniel, anything surprise you uh, about this day? I mean, I know you cover and follow politics closely. You and I talk about it, it feels like, almost endlessly. Anything about this day surprise you? It, it, it was quiet. Um, I think we were all kind of bracing and, and worried about more violence, more um, you know, action. I mean, we, you, you mentioned I'm in I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. There were a grand total of three protesters outside the state capitol today. So um, after what happened two weeks ago, um, you saw you know extreme 
military and police presence that not just in Washington, but at state capitals all over the country. And so far, we haven't seen that follow on uh, attack or, or, or violence that everyone was, was worried about. So I guess, I, you know, I was I was, you know, jittery about that. And so that's what surprised me is how quiet it's been. Um, Daniel, who are some of the new names and faces uh, that you think people should uh, pay attention to, whether they're new members of the cabinet, new members of the Congress, uh, new members of, of maybe state legislatures or, or in other positions? Who are three or four interesting political figures uh, that you think will also be a part of whatever the next two to four years is? So I think if you if you look at um, we'll start in North Carolina. There's a, there's, a, there's a guy named Mark Robinson who uh, we profiled on on Ozzy a few weeks ago. He's a lieutenant governor. He has a tremendous story. A, a black Republican who was a factory worker only a few years ago before uh, catching fire and starting his political career, elected lieutenant governor in his first run for office over a, a very seasoned politician. So uh, North Carolina being a key swing state uh, for 2022. Uh, in the Senate race in 2024, again, for the presidency. Uh, he's one to watch. He's, he's a key figure. Um, in Washington, I would point uh, to the Biden cabinet, Javier Becerra, uh, former uh, attorney general out where you are, Carlos, in California, is coming in as HHS secretary. He's going to have a tough nomination fight. He was a, um, a big antagonist of President Trump, you know, a pretty partisan figure when he was in the U.S. House. Uh, and so there's, that's going to be a fight for him to get in. But once he is in, Enormous power uh, vested in HHS from from Obamacare to what's going on with the with the vaccine rollout. Uh, so it'd be important to watch him. Uh, and in Congress, I might I might go with some old names uh, in in Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. These are people who Biden's relationship with them is going to be incredibly important over the next uh, year to two years as he tries to get his agenda through. And we've talked on this program uh, about the the progressives versus the moderates. Uh, and whether you'll see that AOC wing um, really assert itself in pushing back against Biden, well, he's going to need to rely on uh, Warren and Sanders, who have such credibility with the left, but they also have worked with him for a long time. They know how to get things done. And if they're champions for some of his legislation that, that maybe doesn't seem good enough for the left, maybe start with this COVID relief bill that a lot of people are saying is not big enough at $1.9 trillion. If they vouch for it, that's going to go a long way uh, towards keeping Democrats united in the next two years. Daniel Moley, I'm going to let you go. But last quick question. I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to put you on the record. Who is going to be the Republican nominee in 2024? Ooh, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a good one. I am going to go with Donald J. Trump. I think we haven't seen the last of him and he still has such a grip on his party. He's going to have a fight. There's going to be a there's going to be a big big fight. But um, you know, he he didn't look like a guy today who had who had given this thing up. So you're calling him the new Grover Cleveland. You're saying, uh, uh, <laughs> like the president in the late 1800s who dipped in, had a term, dipped out, and dipped back in. You think he, you think he might double dip or at least try you to? You know, Trump put, put Grover Cleveland in his garden of heroes. So many people thought that was a that was an Easter egg. Uh, hinting at hinting at another run and and guy guy loves the spotlight he can't he can't shy away so uh, I think we may we may have not have seen the last of him all right you and Megan Kelly seem to agree Daniel Malloy I'm going to leave it there we go to the other side of the world uh, my friend another one of our senior editors here at Ozzy Charu Kasturi uh, Charu uh, you and I spend Charu you let the beard go I, I'm, I'm liking the fresh and clean look, though. I like the fresh and clean look, too. It looks good as well. Um, Charu, you and I have talked about the fact that American democracy was never America's only, that it was something that was often treasured by other parts of the world who, who looked to America uh, as, a, uh, as a shining star and, and as a role model. What do you think today's inauguration did? Did that restore any of the democratic luster uh, that, that you've told me before you thought may have gotten away? Uh, uh, is it yet to be seen? What do you think today did, if anything? I think today, uh, yes, it, it restored some of the luster that we spoke about. But I think even more importantly, what it did it is it kind of, I think, I think the past few weeks, but culminating today, have for the first time probably in many, many, many years, made American democracy that much more real and approachable and and therefore more believable for people and democratic movements around the world. You've seen its frailties, you've seen how it could, how it's been pretty much on the edge uh, 
and could have very easily tipped over, yet it has survived uh, and and looks poised to kind of uh, recover from, from frailties or from at least some of the fractures that we've seen in recent weeks. And that, I think, is going to send a very important message to uh, kind of emerging democratic movements and young democracies around the world that, look, you know, it isn't as though even America, the country which is in many ways the oldest uh, democracy uh, of the modern kind, uh, and in many ways has been one of the most stable democracies across centuries, even that country can go through the kind of fissures and fractures that we've seen in the past few weeks yet recover, uh, not, not in a way that you paper over what's happened, but in a sense that it, that, 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 that 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 mechanism and those structures of democracy can survive the kind of tensions that we've seen in America. And I think that for me is going to be the key takeaway for a lot of democratic movements around the world. That you don't that you don't assume that things have to be one way or the other. Things can be really difficult, complicated, fractured, you know, almost uh, almost authoritarian in many ways, but but you can still recover from them. Uh, um, and, and that's gonna be the big takeaway. Jar, talk to me about where we might see some of the biggest impact of a Biden administration in terms of foreign policy and international relations. I'm sure you could go to a hundred different places, but if you were only to highlight two or three places where you think we will see some notable differences, what, where should we keep our eye on? I think one of the things that is very easy to kind of forget uh, for Americans, but I think is gonna be really important is, is America's own extended neighborhood, Latin America. Uh, there's a lot of interesting churn happening there. Uh, Bolsonaro doesn't get along. That's the president of Brazil, doesn't get along with Biden at all. He has been backing Trump all the way up to now, including over the conspiracy theories over the elections, et cetera. Uh, the Mexican president has already made moves which are basically meant to provoke Biden and the incoming Biden administration. You have a, a number of uh, what's called leftist leading governments in, 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 uh, in Latin America who've come to power recently, who are fundamentally antagonistic to America and see America as this big bully in, in good measure because of America's problematic past in the region. So dealing with all of them is going to be a big challenge. Venezuela under Nicolas Maduro is now, he's now gained a strong grip there. So dealing with Latin America is going to be a big issue and how, how, how Biden does that is going to be a major factor for him. I think the other key area is going to be in other emerging democracies and emerging countries and parts of the world like Africa and Asia, where uh, America has not always lived up to its ideals. Let me, be, let me put it that way. Uh, so many, uh, in so many cases in Africa, for instance, uh, you have America as the biggest backer of some of the longest serving dictators and autocrats. Uh, so, so there's been this long sentiment in Africa and parts of Asia that America has one set of rules for itself and for its Western allies and another set of rules when it comes to democracy in, in the parts of the world like Africa and Asia. Can Biden change that? I believe he can. I think he has the post possibility to change that and there's a momentum for democratic change around the world. Will he? We'll have to wait and see. And of course, finally, uh, one of the things that Trump has done, uh, and, and I know Trump supporters count it as a victory uh, in many ways, is some of the deals that uh, that were struck in the Middle East uh, in, in the final few weeks and months of the Trump administration, whether it's with the UAE and Israel, whether it's with Bahrain, Morocco, etc. Uh, but those are all very slippery terrain uh, for Trump, uh, for Biden to enter into. Does he continue with those deals, which are problematic at some levels? Uh, does he back out of them and risk the ire of uh, Israel? Uh, those are all going to be some of the tricky issues that uh, that that, that uh, Biden's going to uh, uh, have to deal with. But just one final thought, Carlos, if I may. Sure. Uh, uh, I think a key point to remember for everyone is that it's very easy to assume that Biden is going to basically look to reverse everything that Trump did on the foreign policy front. Uh, he can't. He simply cannot because the world has moved on. Uh, the relationship with China and with Russia is far more complex today than it was in 2016. Uh, so he cannot even if he wished to. Uh, the other point, of course, however, is that, and this is this is for me a little bit of a concern, is that Biden's entire national policy, national security team, uh, is basically a set of people who were part of the Obama team in 2016 and even before. I haven't seen any fresh face there, and therefore I worry whether he has a team that can give him the kind of fresh ideas he'll need to deal with a Xi Jinping of 2021, Vladimir Putin of 2021, who are very different from the figures he and Obama would have dealt with four or five years ago. Yeah, Charu, I, I, I think that's a good point, and I think you're going to see a surprise. 
I predict that the earliest shakeups in the Biden cabinet will be on the foreign policy side and could involve some shuffling, could involve people like Pete Buttigieg going from somewhere like transportation to there or someone like Amy Klobuchar coming out of the Senate and, uh, and going into a role. So we'll stay tuned. Uh, Charo Castori in Bangalore, India. Uh, great to see you as always. My heartfelt thanks to you um, and all of our wonderful guests that we've had here tonight. Uh, Christina Greer, uh, Don Baer, uh, Representative Maxine Waters, Grover Norquist, uh, Megan Kelly, uh, uh, Francesca Pauletta, and so many more. Uh, just so deeply grateful. John Fort and others, thank you so much. Um, I have to tell you that I'm optimistic, and I know for a lot of folks uh, what's happened over the last four years and what's happened, particularly including at the Capitol Mall, really threw some people back. And so many of us um, held our breath as this day was coming. Uh, but I'm going forward boldly. I'm telling everyone I know that I think that the 2020s are going to be the new 60s, that I think that there's going to be a bold opportunity to reimagine what America can be, to welcome in what I like to call America 2.0, and to really reset America, to think differently about love and loneliness and race and gender and capitalism and war and work and robots, and to think about it not just in simplistic red and blue ways, but sometimes in just bold and fresh, creative ways. Maybe those ideas will come from outside of the U.S. Maybe they'll come, as Charu said, from uh, uh, our neighbors in uh, Latin America. Maybe they'll come from other parts of the world. Uh, but I hope that we do that. I want to welcome you uh, to join me in that conversation over the next year. On The Carlos Watson Show, we're going to be asking each and every one of our guests, from Dr. Fauci to Cardi B, from LeBron James to uh, to uh, President Biden, uh, uh, how they want to reset America and how they want to think boldly and differently about us. So send us your ideas. Uh, hit us up in the comments section here. Look forward to seeing you again. Be safe, be well, and uh, hope you continue to enjoy the Carlos Watson Show.